On the news, Nigeria goes tough on PNID, confiscates assets. Months after alleged 3 billion naira fraud, President Buhari suspends Oyoita as head of civil service. Uncertainty as Israel's opposition rejects Netanyahu's unity government. Many thanks for joining us on News Now on TV360 Nigeria. A federal high court in Abuja has ordered the closure of operations of Process and Industrial Development Limited, PNID and PNID Nigeria Limited. Justice Iyangeko, who gave the order, also directed the forfeiture of the assets and properties of the firm to the Nigerian government. The judge made the orders shortly after the firm, through their representatives, pleaded guilty to the 11 counts instituted against them by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Tunjoye has that story. The $9 billion contract saga between the federal government of Nigeria and the Process and Industrial Development Company, PNID, is getting more interesting as the federal high court sitting in Abuja on Thursday convicted two suspects on allegations of fraudulent involvement in the 2010 contract between Nigeria and the Irish firm. The suspect, the commercial director of the company, Mohamed Kushazi, PNID British Virgin Island, pleaded guilty to 10 count charge, while Adam Usman of PNID Nigeria Limited pleaded guilty to all 11 count charge. In a short ruling, Justice Inyang Ekwo convicted both men following details presented by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. They were both alleged to have committed an offense related to money laundering, abuse of office, and economic sabotage. An 11-count charge that bordered essentially on four critical issues. The first of these had to do with obtaining by false pretenses. The second had to do with uh, dealing in petroleum products without appropriate licenses. Um, the third of it had to do with uh, money laundering. Of, and uh, the fourth one had to do with failure to comply with uh, requirements of the Special Control Unit against money laundering. And uh, both companies pleaded guilty. And we went through a review of the facts of the case, presented all documents that were recovered in the premises of uh, the commercial director of the company. We also presented to the court statements of account showing massive withdrawals of dollars, some running into $700,000. Uh, we also showed infraction of uh, Money Laundering Prohibition Act as well as the advanced fraud, and also confirmed uh, to the court that at no point in time did PNID ever had the land in Nigeria that would have kick-started the project at any point in time at all. And uh, given the plea of guilty, the court entered uh, judgment. And because the charges were against uh, companies under both the Advance Fee Act and the Money Laundering Prohibition Act, the court ordered the winding up of both companies and the forfeiture of all their assets to the federal government of Nigeria. The company has reviewed their activities and they believe that it is in their best interest to enter such a plea, not to prolong the matter. And I think it is the right decision. Uh, I mean, uh, having considered the facts and antecedents of the matter, so uh, that is the right thing to do. The judge said the punishment to be meted out on them is contained in the Advanced Fee Fraud Act and the Money Laundry Act, and order that assets of the company in Nigeria be forfeited to the federal government. The judge also said the company should round off their operations in the country. From Abuja. President Muhammad Buhari has approved the appointment of Folashade Yemiesan as the acting head of the civil service of the Federation with immediate effect. This follows the indefinite suspension of Winifred Oyoita following investigations into a three billionaire fraud claim against her. Until her appointment, Yemiesan was the permanent secretary, Ministry of Petroleum Resources. Buhari also approved the extension of the tenure of three of, I beg your pardon, seven retiring permanent secretaries for a period of one calendar year with effects from 1st October 2019. According to the president, the move is to ensure stability in the federal civil service and effective delivery on the nine priority areas of the administration, 
as well as the mandates given to the new ministers. The president's action is in line with the powers conferred on the section 171 subsection 2D of the 1999 constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended. President Muhammad Buhari will travel to New York, United States to participate in the 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly, UNGA 74. He will depart Abuja for New York on Sunday to attend the conference, which will be declared open on Tuesday, September 17. This was disclosed on Wednesday in a statement signed by the special advisor to the president, Femi Additional. The president's participation at this year's gathering of world leaders is particularly significant as it coincides with Nigeria's presidency of UNGA. Buhari will be accompanied by various delegates, including Governor Abdullahi Sile of Nasarawa State, Abubakar Bagudu of Kebi State, and Adiboyega Oyutola of Oshun State. The federal government has appealed to all Nigerians to assist in the reintegration process of returnees repatriated from South Africa as a result of xenophobic attacks. Chairman of the Nigerian Teen Diaspora Commission said this while receiving the newest batch of Nigerians at the Motala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos. An initial 319 people were expected back, but five of them couldn't make the flight due to documentation issues. But in all, 314 people were successfully evacuated. This next report has the details. So just behind me is the point where documentation begins for the returnees. They are brought in a bus and then upon arrival at this point, they begin documentation where they get their phone and SIM cards and also proceed inside for medicals and other forms of documentation. Unlike the previous um, time when they arrived, the last arrival where there was complete, or should I say free access to them, this time around the arrangement is completely different. But journalists did manage, or we did manage to talk to some of them and they do have or find stories to tell. Hello. Slowly the returnees alight from the bus here at the Hajj terminal with the luggage waiting to be claimed. Comfort stands on the queue with her three children having left her husband behind. She was selling Nigerian foodstuffs in South Africa and she recalls vividly how all she's worked for were destroyed before her very eyes. They burned down my business. They burned it all. So there was nothing left, though I didn't feel it because my life and my kids' own was the most important thing. If I'm in the shop, they will be looting my house, they'll be packing things in my house. When I get to the house, maybe if I'm sleeping in the house, they'll also be looting my shop. So it's like I'm working for them. When I gather, gather, try to survive before you know, all is gone. As before now, the South African government tendered an unreserved apology to Nigeria for attacks on its citizens. While some of these returnees are impressed by the gesture, others do not value it. To me, it's welcome. A person of that height saying he regrets his people's action, you know, and apologizing at the same time. I, I, I appreciate, I applauded his act on that day, honestly. They just burned my workshop then burn all the tools that I'm using to work there. So since then we have been running up and down every day. We can't even sit one place and rest. The apology has nothing to do because already our things is gone. And even today when we are coming back in the airport, they don't even want to check us in like the people, like they want them to go. They keep on delaying us. They are not happy. They are only trying to like be concerned with the government. But for we personally, individual, they're not happy with us. Even every day they tell us, you must go back to your country, you must go back to your country, you know? So they're not happy, it's just the only the president uh, issue. You know, when I was coming at the airport, they say I'm the one killing them. They moved me till blood was pouring from my nose. My tongue, my, my mouth dry, no single saliva. They say I should eat food. I said food. I cannot pass here. So until when they see me dying, until they gave me water to drink, it was not easy. Inside the hall, the returnees receive a token from Lagos State. The government says this is a simple way of contributing to their reintegration. It's the good heartedness of Governor Babajide Sonwolu. He saw the plight of Nigerians in diaspora without South Africa and he's particularly created his office, Diaspora Foundation, to cater for the needs of diasporans. 
So when he heard they were coming back on this flight, he made a provision for an allowance of that sum of money, 20000 uh, to be given to them so they could have something to eat, have something to stay if possible, just so they can be integrated back into the country. Chairman of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission also pleads for more support for the returnees. I also want to appeal to Nigerians to support them because they, they are not criminals. The only crime is that they are black and Nigerian. So for those who want to, they are still open for support. And state governors are, have also been very responsive. We've given them names of their citizens with their phone numbers and they've promised total reintegration. And of course the back of industry provision is there. They, we've, we've given them numbers to call at their own time. They call back of industry and they get soft loans. So I think that's a good welcome package. However, we're not stopping there. Subsequently, we're going to uh, conduct a needs assessment in about two weeks so within the next two weeks a month we'll call them again to find out how they are doing what they're doing and what more needs to be done through the free flight offered by airpiece limited this new arrival brings the total number of nigerians evacuated from south africa to 501 chairman of the airline allen onyema has been praised by many for the singular act of kindness and is now being considered for a national honor Unyi Adekunle, TV360, Lagos. Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo has presided over the National Economic Council meeting at the presidential villa Abuja. The meeting is the second since the inauguration of President Mohamed Buhari's cabinet for the second term. The meeting was attended by state governors and the Inspector General of Police, among others. Briefing journalists after the meeting, police boss Mohamed Adamu spoke on the current security situation in the country. Take a listen. The security situation in the country is stable. We made comparison of uh, what had happened in the previous quarters and then uh, this quarter, and we saw that uh, there is tremendous decrease in uh, kidnapping, uh, banditry, and um, arm robbery and even act of uh, cultism. Um, you can see from the situation in Northwest, banditry has reduced tremendously. Kidnapping also have gone down. And this have, we have statis statistics to back it. Now, having noticed that we've been charged by Mr. President to do more, he wants to see um, a near zero uh, crime society in the, in the whole of the country. So we've been charged to do more than what we are doing now. Uh, but um, in all the geopolitical zones, in fact, the whole of the country. Recently, there have been some series of peace initiatives, especially um, the Thief Jukun um, crisis. The federal government came up with initiative by trying to, by bringing the leadership of the two states and um, their traditional rulers. Nigerian governors have agreed to repay the 614 billion Naira bailout funds granted to them by the federal government on one condition. They say the accounts have to be reconciled first. At a meeting of the Nigerian Governors Forum on Wednesday, Chairman of the NGF, Governor Kaede Fayemi of Ekiti State, demanded that the bailout support be reconciled with debts that the federal government allegedly owes state. Many of such debts involve amounts used to repair federal roads by state governments. The federal government gave the conditional budget support facility to 35 states in 2017 to enable them meet their financial obligations to civil servants and pensioners. The loans were provided at a 9% interest rate with a grace period of two years. But with the expiration of the grace period last week, the federal government announced that it will, in the next two weeks, commence the deduction from statutory allocation to the state. Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, says this, uh, that the repayments will be taken from the affected state allocation during the next Federation Accounts Allocation Committee meeting later this month. Now, between August and September 2019, at least 2,667 houses, farmlands, roads, and bridges have been damaged after a flood hit 17 local government areas in Niger State. The Director General of Niger State's Emergency Management Agency, Ahmed Ingra, disclosed this in an interview with newsmen in Mina on Thursday. He said most of the buildings, roads, and bridges were completely washed away by flooding across the affected communities. 
among the affected local government areas are uh, Rafi, Murara, Paikoro, Sileja, IJ, Kacha, Kotangora, Bago, and Shiroro. Inga added that the report of the incident had been submitted to the governor to provide supportive measures to the affected persons. The Parliament of ECOWAS, uh, I beg your pardon, the Parliament of the Economy Community of West African State has called on the support of the United Nations and other development partners in solving problems across the region. Speaker of the ECOWAS Parliament, Mustafa Sesilo, made the call when he led a delegation to pay a courtesy visit to the United Nations Diplomatic Corps in Liberia. Sesilo highlighted the role of the Parliament in ensuring that peace and stability is maintained across the West African region and pleaded for your support to address the current problems faced in West Africa. Other members of the delegation point to the proliferation of arms as the reason why insecurity persists in West Africa. They also urged the UN to sanction European com companies that smuggle arms to non-state actors in Africa. I would like to appeal to each and every one of you here, being international organizations, the UN system, so that you are doing a lot in helping our government. And I believe that also through your voice, there can be more awareness, there can be more advocacy, so that there will be a real change. I'm an entrepreneur. People of our humble mind to bring us support to the ECOWAS state, help the ECOWAS state to realize our dream, our objective in West Africa. Well, should be reminded of their responsibility that West Africa is the poorest region on earth. And one of the reasons why this region is the poorest on earth is that Europeans do not help us in curbing the import of small and light weapons into our region. We cannot go to farms other than South Africa and perhaps Egypt. No country in Africa manufactures even a bullet. All these things have their origins from Europe and America. Is there any way, any way that we can sanction companies in Europe that imports or exports these things to non-state actors in Africa? It is making us poorer and making us by force to cross the Sahara and then cross the Mediterranean. And when we get to Europe and America, our color betrays us. We are victims of some of the actions of European imperialism. And I hope that now with our conscience as a people, there is a way the Europeans can help us see that we mop up small and large weapons and will prevent European comp companies from trading with our lives in West Africa. We'll take a break now and we'll be right back. Do stay with us. Corruption not in my country. Caught. All right. What's your name again? Kemi? Good. Are you ready for us for next week? Yes, sir. Next. No one, sir. No. What? Look, what we need here is one who can speak fluent English. Give her a chance. I need a angel to hold me. Hold me, my beautiful angel. Cut! It is angel, not angel. Please, I'm done with you. Excuse us. Kemi was far better. It's not about our rendition. It's not about our performance here. By the time she and her friends join us in our hotel room, <laughs> you will know how far. Can I have her phone? She has a robust profile. She's a real robust profile. I do not undercut professional ethics. It is an act of corruption. Not in my country. Corruption not in my country. Stop corruption now. You're welcome back. Let's now join Oyi Adekale for the latest business stories. Hello, Oyi. Hi, Aneka. Please bring us up to date with the headlines in business today. Well, fear of increased hardship for Nigerians is one that masks the federal government's resolve to increase value-added tax from 5% to 7.5%. The move has been rejected by most Nigerians, including economic experts, who are urging the government to adjust its tax policy to mitigate the possible impact on the people. Adeshewa Odushoga now reports. It is not the first time the federal government will be proposing to increase the value of the tax. And just like time passed, it has been met with stiff opposition. 
The current move has generated so many reactions that the Minister of Finance had called for calm, clarifying what products will be affected. VAT is a consumption tax. It's not applicable on food. It is not applicable on medic any, any medical care equipment or medicaments. It is also not applicable on transport. So if you decide to go to the market and buy food items and go home and cook, you're not paying VAT. But if you decide to go to a restaurant and have a meal, you will pay VAT. If you procure items that are high-end, that are not covered by the exemptions, you'll be paying VAT. But the ordinary Nigerian, most of their day-to-day -day life activities, including education, there is no VAT on any material related to education are fully exempted. As much as the government is under pressure to increase its revenue, the means of implementation has sprung a public argument. These analysts say there is a need for adjustment in its regulation. It is essential for us to appreciate the pressure government is on, under. At the same time, it is very important for government to also uh, find ways to minimize the impact of these increase on, on the citizen. Because, uh, uh, like I said, coupled with the expected increase in uh, prices of electricity tariff and these and many more reforms possibly that will come, uh, some level of uh, amendments needs to be made to the existing uh, regulation such that at least a few of those at the lower end should be exempted and so the, the increase will not affect them. Out of 1.5 million businesses in Nigeria, only 5% of them are remitting its value added tax. These, according to analysts, may be as a result of ignorance or lack of confidence in the government. Government needs to start delivering such that in one way or the other people can see that the taxes that they pay is being utilized the right way and with that uh, confidence will come in and believe in the, in the government willingness to pay these taxes uh, like we said our problem is not so much around it's not all about uh, compliance there are entrepreneurs that genuinely don't know they should charge VAT when they, they provide, they sell goods and services. With oil making up 90% of Nigeria's foreign exchange received, President Mohamed Dubuari has dedicated efforts to boost the non-oil revenue. And an increase in the VAT may be one of the many ways the government intends to carry out its plans. Adisha Wadushoga, TV360, Lagos. Electricity contractors who receive money but fail to execute projects should be jailed. Stakeholders in the power sector said this during a media launch organized by the anti-corruption group Center for Health, Equity and Justice. They condemned non-performing electricity contractors for failing to do their jobs after receiving money from the government. They are now calling on government to hold them to account. Abisola Adebayo has more on this report. In February 2019, then Minister of Power, Works and Housing, Babatunde Fashola, dismissed reports of runaway power contractors. But this civil rights group is now claiming otherwise, presenting its findings from a research on Nigeria's power sector. Center for Health, Equity and Justice says non-performing electricity contractors is the bane of Nigeria's power sector. A trend in which a particular company over and above other, other companies in the sector got several contracts. Most of those contracts were not either executed at all or properly executed. We discovered some con of those contracts by the same organization and its Nigerian collaborator were awarded without going through the bidding process because we didn't, we saw only one company bid it and the same company won the contract. The same company will realize that got contract that didn't go through the Federal Executive Council. If it went through the Federal Executive Council, we want them to convince Nigerians, not us, who are researchers, we don't have anything to, uh, to do with them. They should go and convince Nigerians. Government should truly privatize the power sector if it hadn't done so. Um, they should try to put in place serious, straight measures to control and monitor those contracts, both at the level of bidding, evaluation, pre or post contract evaluation. To further prove their claim, 
the group invited electricity consumers in Lagos State to share their experience so far with the power sector. We have rights to light. Our government should provide us with adequate electricity. If it is a pay meter, let them give us. It's not accredited. You are billing us. If people are not able to pay the bill, you come to the community harassing the people with police. Why? Why should that be? After you frauding us, you come again to lay attack on us by the police, by the Nigerian police. We are rejecting the estimated bill and paying for blackout. And we are calling on Nigerian government to hold them accountable because there are series of, series of corruption going on in the electricity electric, in the electric system. So we are calling on Nigerian government to hold them accountable. With the challenges identified, solutions are now preferred. They should unveil the individuals behind those companies mentioned in the report because I think it's the right time for us to now begin to have consequences for our action. Whatever we do, there must be consequences. If I'm found to have done something, there has to be consequences. We know about sins being committed. We know about fraud. But we have never seen any major consequence. What we have seen are inconsequential, non-important people going to jail. Let us for once see so-called important people go to jail. With Nigeria's large oil, gas, hydro and solar resource, the country has the potential to generate over 12,500 megawatts of electricity power, but it is only able to generate a little over 4,000 megawatts of power. For this group, Nigeria cannot reach its full potential in power generation until power contractors are held accountable. Abisola Adebayo, TV360, Lagos. Up next, the stock market review, but that will be after this break. Please stay tuned. The Nigerian Stock Exchange doesn't seem to have seen the last of the bears this week as it um, reversed the gains it managed to earn this week uh, from midweek trading yesterday. The All Share Index declined by 0.13%. And just yesterday, investors were all smiles after gaining 134 billion naira. But all that has gone with trading yesterday as the market capitalization of all listed equities went from 13.475 billion naira to 13.458 billion naira today and that's a loss of around 17 billion downturn in the financial services sector impacted the general performance of the market today we see guarantee zenith bank and of course access bank and cotex um, leading the um, top losers chart today of course top um, cotex is from the industrial goods sector but dominating the losers chart the most we can see there of um, stocks from the financial services sector. And on the flip side to the top gainers, Dangote Sugar recorded the highest price gain of 75 cobalt to close at 10 naira 55 cobalt per share. USCN followed with a gain of 70 cobalt. And moving on, PZ Cousins and Dangote Flower. PZ actually recorded a 60 cobalt price gain, while Dangote Flower appreciated by 35 cobalt to close at 22 naira and 40 cobalt per share. In summary, the value of um, trade went up from 5.3 billion, went down, I beg your pardon, from 5.3 billion naira to 1.647 billion naira today. And that's, that's really bad. If we must say just from 5 billion to 1 billion today, that's almost 4 billion naira loss. And moving on to global markets now, um, all in the greens, we see that all three bounced back today. FTSE firmed up to 0.58% gain. And the Dow Jones also rose as investors welcomed the Federal Reserve forecast that there may be no further interest rate cuts this year. Nikkei as well also rose by 0.38%. So that's it from here. It's back to you, Aneta. Thanks for that update, Oye. And now to foreign scene. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has offered to form a national unity government with his strongest political rival, Benny Gantz. And that's after both men failed to secure a governing majority 
in a tight election. With over 95% of results counted from the second round of voting, opposition Blue and White Party looks poised to emerge slightly ahead of Netanyahu's liquid, but also shots of enough supporters in the 120-member parliament for a ruling bloc. Gans has however rejected the offer for partnerships, saying his party will not sit in a government led by Netanyahu. Once all the votes are counted, President Ruven Rivlin, who will welcome Netanyahu's unity call, will hold consultations with parties that won representation in parliament and give one of its leaders up to, if, uh, to 42 days to form a government. And in sports, Nigeria has made progress at the FIBA Men World Rankings released today. The Tigers moved 10 places up, which means the country now acquires its 23rd spot from a 33rd position earlier for the reign in the first spot on the continent. However, it's not a total win for the country as the Super Eagles drop one spot to finish 34th best footballing country worldwide in the latest FIFA ranking. Despite the drop, Nigeria still occupies the third position on the continent behind Senegal and Tunisia. And that's all for now on News Now on TV 360 Nigeria. Many thanks for watching and bye for now.